So first of all, thank you everyone uh, for joining us with Empower You tonight. Um, we also appreciate you, be, you know, being able to be nimble. And of course, we were supposed to have um, Scott up here last Wednesday, and I think we got about a foot of snow. <laughs> um, so we're, we're, we appreciate you um, being here tonight uh, with the date change. So I have known Scott uh, for I don't know, maybe four or five years, and he's just an incredible mind when it comes to entrepreneurialism. Um, he's currently an advisor for Innisfear Ventures, which is Colorado's leading technology incubator, helping companies commercialize their technology in the U.S. After retiring recently, oh, and he's had a few trips since that time to actually January, he was just telling me is the really is the first month he hasn't had a lot to do. So he might be questioning retirement. I don't know. Um, but nonetheless, he um, just loves that entrepreneurial spirit and supporting um, entrepreneurs uh, any way he possibly can. Um, before joining Innisfear, Scott had a 35 year career with HP and Agilent Technologies. Um, including 10 years as the VP and GM, leading his teams to develop best-in-class measurement products. Scott also earned a BS in electrical engineering and an MBA from the University of Rochester. By the way, my, one of my sons received um, an offer to play football. From you? Yeah. <laughs> I didn't know that hey, until right now. I mean, I knew about that. Good education. I yeah, I knew about this. At least. I, we had to say no. <laughs> Nonetheless, we're going to have a great time tonight. Um, really taking a look at some of the ins and outs of entrepreneurialism, you know, the, the components that it takes to start up a business, what you need to know. Please ask questions along the way. Um, that makes for the best interaction. And without further ado, Thanks. I'll go ahead and hand it over. Thanks. How do I advance? Is that this guy down here? Let's see. Do you know if that... We'll get that squared away and then... Just tried that one. Uh, I wonder if Enter does it. So that definitely does it, and so does that. So either the mouse or okay, or that yeah. guy. I'll do. Okay, perfect. Got it. Thanks. All right. So thanks to the um, set people for inviting me, and I want to make this as interactive as possible. So let's not put these two nice guys on the spot. You, Sam, you can ask questions and all that. And um, maybe to reinforce what Laurie said, I don't, as near as I can tell, there are no embellishments or outright lies in terms of what Laurie read. So maybe that's... It's kind of a uh, <laughs> kind of a statement and sign of the time um, if your first name is George. Anyway, so um, this is material that I did at Startup Week, uh, sort of, with the idea of um, a lot of our experience at Innisfear is based on science and tech, and I tried to wash that out as best I could. Um, and so happy to answer science and tech questions and happy to take a guess at um, any other kinds of businesses. So totally open in that regard. Um, as Lori mentioned, um, I have a tech background. My um, site that I worked at is uh, out on 402 and Love One. So I know this area, I've lived here for more than 40 years. Um, I retired early. Here's the little adder. I retired early. Um, with the idea of uh, full retirement, but found myself really drawn to the startup ecosystem. And um, as I motored around and asked people, hey, what do, what do young retired guys like me do all day? They said, oh man, you should work with startups because you understand tech, you've managed a business at a, at a fairly high level. And so much of sort of that experience grounds you in customers and competition and a little bit of uh, the money side, um, that kind of thing. And so I lasted two full years, retired, and then I spent seven within a sphere and touched, um, on the way down, I was thinking, I think I've touched somewhere between 500 and 1,000 startups, meaning either sat across the table and spent some time or coached them for a year or two and kind of that full spectrum. 
um, 99 percent of them in, in Colorado. So pretty good feel for what's going on uh, locally. All right, makes sense. If this is not the bus you want to be on, now it's a great. All right. So um, two only two slides. Commercial for Inspire um, started in '99 as a way to support science and tech. If you go back to '99, the dot com meltdown was sort of uh, on the horizon, and City of Fort Collins thought, "Hey, look, there may be people that get laid off from the tech employers in Fort Collins." Um, but want to start a business or at least stay as a citizen and, and do something like starting a business. So that's the roots. Um, the history, most of what we do is in Colorado, but I'd say the last four or five years between COVID, Zoom, and grants, we've expanded the footprint to include a lot of the surrounding states. We have clients pretty much um, Montana, Wyoming, North and South Dakota, Kansas, Texas, Oklahoma, kind of that region. Because I think everybody got really comfortable with Zoom and it's not bad. So typically these are the industries and um, it's really a reflection of stuff that's going on in the state. So a lot of clean tech, you know, renewables, you have facilities like Enrel that support that um, energy advanced materials, a lot of stuff coming out of school of mines, um, as well as CU Boulder and, and CSU and Fort Collins. Um, a fairly healthy life science, bioscience. There's some animal stuff that transitions to humans that CSU gets involved in, but there's also med device, you know, Medtronic, um, people leave that business and go start a company. And then um, finally, hardware and enterprise software. Most of my experience is here, although I've learned a ton about those industries. Okay. And then we'll, um, Innisfer is a fee-based organization. So we take clients on for 2,500 a month. And a lot of what we do is get them ready for funding. But that sounds simple in the sense of, hey, how hard can it be a pitch deck? I'll explain my company. But because of the volume and the intensity that we see, we're able to really poke holes or find gaps in the story. That's maybe a better way to say it. Um, if your story doesn't hold water and, and hold together very well, the chance of being funded is going to be pretty small. And so a lot of it is, OK, tell me more about your tired customer. Why are you going to win against competition? What really is the size of the market? All of the detail behind the, the 10 or 15 slides. So a lot of companies come to us with the idea of, of raising money. And then we put together a support package that includes you know, access to capital, competitive analysis, where do you want to take the company? Is it going to get acquired down the road? That kind of thing. OK, makes sense. And as Lori said, I left at the end of August and still sort of finding my way. I don't know if I want to be fully retired yet, but we'll see. All right, so for tonight or this afternoon, um, what I picked was there's really three or four reasons that startups um, fail to execute or fail to get off the ground. And it really comes down um, to customers, uh, capital, and, um, and the product itself, competition. So I'm gonna take you through some of the things that we see as the most common problems through that sort of data set of 500 to 1,000 um, startups. And that's, that's the roadmap. And again, you know, interrupt or ask questions. Any questions so far? Okay, all right. Why does it fail? Yeah. Why does it fail? Yeah, good question. Um, so this is some data from um, CB Insights, and it's been pretty stable over the years. We look at it every time they publish. So uh, why do startups fail? And this is across full spectrum, not just science and tech, it's, it's all startups. So number one reason is run out of cash. And I'm gonna dispute that that's not always true, but it is the most obvious to see the uh, understanding what's behind it is not always running out of cash. No market need, how competed or lose to the competition or a flawed business model. And so this is kind of the anchor point for what we're gonna talk about. All right, so 
in a sphere, somebody walks up on the door, you meet them at an army of cops, you trip across them at sea boulder, and they say, I've got an idea that's better, faster, cheaper, breakthrough. No one else can do this. I'm the smartest person in the planet, or at least in the room. And so they start down the path of developing that solution, hardware, software, biotech, clean tech, whatever, whatever it is. Um, typically, they're spending their own money. A lot of entrepreneurs are still working 40 hours a week doing something in their basement, up in a bedroom, you know, trying to figure out what it is. And obviously, that's not true with life science, but you get the idea, right? Because um, if you think, you think about how hard it is to start a business, most of our clients were not 20 or 25 or 30 years old. Most of them are north of 40, maybe even 50 years old, right? So they have some experience with the innovation or the product that they're trying to do. So they may be supporting a family, they may have a house payment, that kind of thing. So they can take it only so far without getting some outside funding to open a lab or quit work and devote more to full time. And that's where it becomes um, kind of tricky. So ways to access funding. And that kind of take you through um, sort of a sequence or a hierarchy. The most common thing to do when you're first starting out is what's called self-funding. Really what that means is I have a bank account and I go and pull money out or I take out a home equity loan. We see that pretty often. Or sometimes apply for a grant and you're lucky enough, you know, very competitive process, lucky enough to get it. Um, but at the same time, um, those funds are not unlimited, right? Most people that create an invention or start a company aren't wealthy beyond all means such that they can stay in this mode for very long, right? And so it can be stressful. We've seen people who totally believe in what they're doing and come to the table and say, I have to stop. We're out of money. My honey bun just will not tolerate this anymore. And so sometimes you'll see a working spouse while the other spouse is off trying to invent. So so really tough. So how do you how do you get out of that? Um, grants that I mentioned a couple minutes ago can help fund development. Another that some people never realize is take on a co-founder, a co-founder with money, and give them part of the equity, and take on somebody that has different skills than you. Right? I'm the invention guy. He's the business guy, or vice versa. Financial person. And, uh, and a tech person. Not a bad marriage. It's hard for founders, though, to give up equity um, that soon, but facing, hey, this isn't going to go anywhere unless you, unless you do that. Scott, we're getting this information to the previous slide with 35% of businesses. The reason that they fail is right. they want money. Yep. So, are you? Do you see most of this happening in early seed rounds, or is it you know in, even in Series C that these companies are running out of business or running out of money? Yeah, it can happen at any point in time. Ninety-nine percent of my experience is sort of a uh, this stage angel. Um, early stage. Yeah. Right, failure to launch, yeah. kind of, kind of thing, to really get off the ground and and create a viable business. Um, and I'll reflect some more on that. Right. Okay. I, I was going to agree with you. I think that the thirty five percent is is gratuitous to saying that's the the reason why they fail. It's it's a lot more product market fit and customer discovery than it hasn't been on purpose by the Yeah, exactly, and that'll be. I'm going to spend quite a bit of time on that because um, people have asked, hey, if you could if you could say one thing to the mass of people that you've talked to, no one does customer discovery talk to your customer. good enough. <laughs> At the end of the day, um, if you don't have a customer, you don't have a business. So got to get that right. Okay. Anything else? Oh, let me do that. Yeah. Here's the hierarchy. So what we've talked about is um, right at the bottom, sort of friends, you'll hear terms like friends and family and self-funded, that kind of thing. The next stage is really more formal, and that's um, called pre-seed funding, where you might hear a term like an angel investor or 
uh, a convertible note or, or debt or equity. And I'll, I'll talk more about that. Um, above that, you can run into people that um, get funding through a, what's called a family office. Um, a family office is um, typically think of it as high net worth individual who's cashed out, um, made enormous sums of money. I'm going to exaggerate a little bit and wants to give back and invest in startups. And so um, there's several in Colorado. They're hard to find. These people do not want to be known. They want to be more private. And so they hire individuals to manage their wealth. That organization is what's called a family office. And so Dave's family office, I know, is right up the street, right? You know I'm pulling your leg. But um, if you've ever run across Pat Stryker, um, her wealth came from her grandfather. Stryker is a uh, medical. Um, Pat has a family office, right? A set of people that manage her real estate, her philanthropy. And so if you think about her as an individual, she has very specific goals and very specific things that she's interested in. So if you came to Pat with a clean energy idea, you probably wouldn't get very far. It's just not something that she's interested in. So typically family offices are lined up with something that they're familiar with and usually has roots in how they made, made money. So tough to find, but if you can find one, a great, a great asset. All right, let me move on. So here's the deal on angels. Um, there's two kinds. There's angels as individuals, and there's angels as groups. And angels typically, um, our, our VC, Rockies Venture Club, you guys ever heard? Heard of that? Yeah, that's probably the most well-known group, angel group. And so if you were walking into a funding event, you'd see a um, whole bunch of people who are eager to what's called direct invest in a startup. And maybe what they want to do is write a check for 25 or 50K. Maybe they have a million to play with and maybe want to make 20 investments. So that's 50K a pop. Um, a group will syndicate all that and kind of pull it together and present the founder with, you know, a check for maybe 200 or 150, 300, something like that. So um, the painful part is if you're not talking a group, then you're talking to angel number one, angel number two, angel number three, angel number four, and number five. And so it's the, you know, you can kiss a lot of frogs before you ever find the prince kind of problem. And that's hard because, uh, a lot of them love the story. They want to hear what's going on. Oh, you have a new investment. Oh, that's very interesting. But they're limited in terms of you know, the practical side of, of what they can invest. So um, kind of the first, first level is angels. Perfect question. Sure. If you're seeking those dollars and maybe you just moved to the area or you've been trying to make everything from Wall Street, how does the yeah, great question. Um, part of the Innisphere program, we have guest speakers come in. And one of the one of my favorites is a guy who runs a platform in California um, to solve exactly that problem. But the tool that he loves is LinkedIn. He goes, hey, get a premium, whatever it's called, the membership where you can go search people. Yeah, and, and so you can throw in some keywords and you can find people on LinkedIn that are interested in direct investments. And you can start to create a little map of, boy, I really, I really want to talk to George, um, but I don't know him, but I know Fred and Fred knows George. And so you start to create a little bit of map. Hey, Fred, would you introduce me to George? Here's what I've got. He's invested before. I think, I think he might be interested in what I have to offer. So a, a lot of detective work, um, not easy, takes a lot of time, some patience. Uh, but yeah, the angel networks are good in the sense of you can walk into a room and at least there's 20 people and maybe there's one in there that's um, viable. Yeah. Another thing too is find find 
companies and, and founders they've invested in and talk to them. I think that's always simply why well, I know somebody about an investor working with them. Talk to people that they work with. The next rung up beyond the angels are small venture capital, and you can use a tool like PitchBook. Um, it's an expensive tool for an individual, but like we have access to it, we have a subscription. So if you were hooked into Innisfear or some of the other support organizations, they can go, oh, for um, for clean energy companies looking to raise a million, here are the 10 venture companies that have that in their crosshairs. Mm -hmm. So it's very similar to what you just said. Find others like that, that look like me, and then I'm gonna go talk to them. Hey, we're a company, we've invested in X, Y, and Z, we look just like them, <laughs> you know, can, can you be interested? All right, so here's the other bad news on the group process, groups underlying to emphasize that, it takes a long time. Uh, I'd say a very common mistake from the founders that we see is they walk in and say, yeah, I'm ready to raise money, and it's January 25th. I think in February for it's gonna it's gonna happen, right? Six to nine months for group process, and, and why is that? Okay, so imagine um, a room of 20 investors. I give a pitch. I go away. Somebody that's facilitating says, "Hey, who's interested?" Few hands go up, right? Not all 20 because some of them have no clue is this a good idea or a bad idea, no experience in that industry, blah, 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 right? So a few hands go up. They get those people off to the side. Who wants to take the lead? Meaning the due diligence process. Is it a real invention? Is there IP behind it? How big is the market? Has this person ever done this before? Do they have a clue as to what it's going to take? The, the lead job is intensive and it's time consuming. So finding a lead out of this sometimes can lead to, you know, a lot of time, right? All right. That's good, that's good enough on that. All right, I talked a little bit about family office. Let's see if there's anything else that I missed out on. Um, What's the best way to find these groups? Great question, really hard. Yeah. Really hard. You almost have to know somebody that's interacted with the family office and then makes an introduction. Mm -hmm. A cold call knocking on the door usually is about a one in a hundred chance that anybody will. Because think about um, if you're managing, let's say, roughly a billion dollars for somebody, there's a lot of people knocking on the door if you hung a sign out. Right, and said, hey, we, we want to talk to you. And so um, that little team in the family office, um, a lot of them had hooked us. Hey, you got anybody that looks like this? And we understood their objectives and we were very careful to only make introductions if we knew it was a match. How many um, viable family offices are in Colorado? That's a great question, too. I, I would guess. Um, less than a couple dozen in Colorado. I, mean, I was tempted to say 10, yeah. and it's like, well, I just got done telling you how hard they are to find. There's probably ones I don't know, yeah. right? But it's not 100. I'm pretty safe. Go to California, where people have cashed out, like Bay Area, right? A lot of wealth, you know, add a few zeros. Yeah. So, and that's part of the problem, too, right? You got to find them, and then chances are they may not be around the corner. So you bring up another interesting point. Sorry for all the questions. No, it's so, perfect. I'd much rather do this than yeah. pay attention to slides. So a lot of our um, clients who are post, you know, they're post and right. going to IPOs and stuff. Um, they are. Oh my gosh, I just forgot my question. What, what did you just say before that? Um, hard to find the family offices or in California. Oh. In California. So we struggle as a group um, with our location. Right. Compared to, I mean, right. we've been referred to as a Silicon Valley, the East Colorado has for many, many years compared to Silicon right. Valley. Right. Um, but 
The actual battle is the viability of the good science that is actually here. Right. The good right. chemists, the good engineers developing products and so forth. What do you, has that gotten easier over time to get money? Yeah, there's a couple things going on. So um, if somebody were to zoom out of the United States and say, where are the hot spots for startups? Silicon Valley, definitely. Um, Austin, Texas, UT, that area is pretty hot. And sort of the Boston, Washington, New York area. Colorado usually makes either the third or fourth slot. And some of that historically are the universities, the universities and, and miles. Because there's a mention going on, you know, behind the scenes. So I would say in the last three to five years, investors on the coast have started to recognize that there's stuff, viable stuff going on in Colorado. 60% um, of the money funding Colorado companies comes from out of state. 60 is pretty big, yeah. right? Um, and obviously on the coast, there is more money. I mean, Brooklyn, New York is two and a half million people, right? We're, what's the bottom line? A couple million? Not, not only is there really a novel that there's and things happening here, it's that you don't necessarily have to be physically located in right. those spaces yep. to invest. Just like you said, like the, the fact that the money's coming from outside, and you can look at seeing the investment in Colorado companies over the last 10 years, and it, it's a steady yeah. incline. And actually, so much like so right, right. Um, and uh, Zoom, you, you sort of hinted at this, Zoom has made it a lot easier. So somebody in California wants to connect to a, oh, let's do a Zoom at night. And they show up at, you know, 901 with a cup of coffee and have a decent conversation. Um, the other phenomenon that's going on is called valuations, meaning um, what is a company that's pre-revenue and got some IP, some invention, what are they really worth? If you're on the coast, the valuations are higher. And so your investment dollars don't go as far if you're in the center of the U.S., the valuations tend to be lower. Um, that's an attractive thing for investors. It doesn't mean that they don't understand the math. It means that companies here are, are valued a little bit less. And so they can maybe see their dollars go further. And that's a phenomenon that's driving that, that curve, too. Okay. All right, so let me transition a little bit from the angel family office early stage. This is really important because a lot of founders don't get this. Um, there's really, think of it as a four-legged stool that can tip over at any point if there's a short leg. And what you wanna do is, is sort of make sure that none of your legs are unusually short, meaning hey, I really understand the market. I really got my technology flushed out, fully deployed, I have prototypes. I am the right person or I'm not, but I have a co-founder that's gonna fill in some gaps. Um, and, then, and then chances are I have the money to see it, see it through. So quite often what we describe to our clients is you have to evaluate and go around this wheel a lot. Right, because the technology may get out in front, but you really don't know if you've got a competitive advantage, or you really believe you've got a competitive advantage, but you don't have the talent to pull it off. And so investors are evaluating, usually the founder is at the top of the list, but man, they want to see some balance across this thing and not any big open gaps, big, big holes. I can tell you're thinking. I'm all Is that I'm on the slide for the independence continue to prop too? Like yeah. a lot of a lot of founders be like, yeah, I did this once. And like yeah. But that's stuff. why I kind of like the stool thing, right? So you're if if risk reduction is is getting longer and longer legs, you're seeing what's out of balance, but you're you're trying to, you know, build the stool up. That's a bad metaphor, but anyway, you get the idea, right? Okay, here's some fundraising problems. Um, time frame is number one. It always takes longer. 
you run into something in due diligence, there's more questions, people back out, they get skittish. Um, it's just not a fast, it's not a fast process, even when you have your act together. Uh, companies believing they are ready to raise capital um, with one of the advantages of Venusphere is just volume. We've seen tons and tons of pitches. And if we can spot problems and zero in, for sure an investor can, right? And you're always gonna get oddball investor questions, but the fundamentals of why, did, why does the world need this invention? Who's gonna pay for it and can you make money? I'd be really, really crisp about how that's gonna work. Um, and we'll come back to the to the customer thing. Valuations, enough time. I would imagine the investors look to the investors of the world as yeah. a made a short credible source. Yeah. Right. But oh yeah. You know, if, if they're going through your program, they know how to We got that feedback a lot. They they, you know, if they got an introduction in a, or they said hey, we heard you work on Venusphere. That was a little bit of an advantage. Yeah. And then sometimes the flip is true as well. Um, and by that, I mean, a founder will meet an investor. The investor will be intrigued, but spot problems and they'll be through a referral. Hey, Mr. Founder, Ms. Founder, you should be working with Venusphere and then come see me. And so they'll you know, sort of shuffle them off for some and, and remember too, that a lot of our founders are science and tech people, not business people. So right off the bat, they, um, I guess I can say this, you know, financials are foreign to them. Marketing is foreign just because they haven't worked in that space. And so some of it is trying to um, fill out, you know, for knowledge gaps. All right, let me transition how to think about customers. So you're working in an industry, this is in the eyes of um, the founder. You see a better way, pursue the bag, you innovate and invent. You're absolutely convinced that um, the next generation coffee cup, the world cannot live without, right? And that's the, the pothole or the conundrum. Because you're so close, you think you got it. And really what you have, we tell our clients this, you really have a hypothesis and not a proven case. And that's really hard to hear, really, really hard. And some never quite get that. But um, I think this is critical. Um, it's really lack of customers that leads to not being funded. Um, so um, what will guide companies on is, um, look, tell me who your customer really is. So let's uh, let's pretend for a second that we're doing sunglasses. The worst answer is, well, everybody that goes outside sunglasses. All right, are you going out, are you going for fashion or are you going for, let's say, performance or athletics? All right, let's say athletics. Okay, so are you going for runners or cyclists or hikers, joggers? Men, women, do you want lenses that can be, um, you know, for a prescription? Do you want to be able to shake your head and not have your glasses fall off? Um, cyclists tend to ride like this, right? So they're looking at the very top. So if you look at cycling glasses, the rim is way up here, right? Whereas when I ran, no need for that. So if an investor starts poking on, you know, new sunglasses and uncovers a few of these layers of questions and you're not as sharp to be able to say, hey, look, I'm going after 50 and older men triathletes. They run and uh, bike. I really want to go after the vision impaired segment of that. And I'm going to be Oakley because, or I'm going to be Rudy or whoever the because, Right now, now you might gain some attention, but rarely do people really get deep enough to understand this. Um, so all the things, how's it being done today? Um, are there issues in adoption? I'm gonna cover that in a second. What else do they value from the offering? You know, think about if we invented a new cell phone, 
what's what else has to be going along with that, right? Is it, are you going to be on AT and T's network, Verizon? Do you support both of them? Um, phones, carrying case, stuff like that, right? So um, what we try to do with some clients um, who haven't done enough of this is really kind of introduce them to this notion of product market fit and really trying to get them to get out and do um, customer interviews. There's some great material, Steve Blank, a uh, good author in the Bay Area, I think he's still associated with Stanford, whole set of videos on just exactly how to do this. And so uh, typically if clients come to us at Innisfere and they're too early, it's because they haven't done this. So I'll point them at the videos and tell them, you gotta start talking to customers. And the first question would be, well, how many? And so what do you think my answer is? And, and it, it never stops. Yeah. yeah. It looks like a little infinity, yeah. right? I mean, I have business in HP and Ashland, and it was rare that I didn't talk to a customer at least once a month. And this was a long running, long historical business, but stuff changes and people invent whizzy things and you gotta go compete. So I'll, I'll typically say 50 to 100 customers before you ever start selling. And the reason is if you get a volume that, that's, that is that high, you'll see sub segments within the data. And you'll start to understand that, hey, it's really not 25-year-old um, dog walkers. It's 60-year-old X. I'm making that up. But you'll start to see some pattern matches that sharpen your focus and give you more clarity on how you're going to compete. That's, that's really the reason to do it. And you can't do that with five. You're just not, you're not there yet. So um, remember the story about, um, hey, I'm smart and I invented something and I know that this is a better way. That's actually called confirmation bias. So when you start talking to people, you're, listen you're subconsciously listening for validation. And it's because we're human beings. That's, we don't like rejection. We want to hear that, oh man, that is a good idea. And uh, the unfortunate part is even if you're doing customer discovery, sometimes people are so polite, they tell you it's a good idea. And then the meeting's over and they go in the bathroom and go, oh man, I can't believe I wasted 30 minutes on that stupid idea, right? So you have to be really clever about trying to understand. Um, I used to think of it as um, seek to understand was kind of my mind. It's like we'd go into a factory and we'd see something going on and I'd say, why do you do it that way? What problems do you have with that? Have you ever shut the line down because you couldn't figure something out? You know, and so you're, you're trying to live in their shoes without ever sort of saying, well, you know, do you like this? And um, the best ones that we had, you could come back and say, hey, look, ask this question. If it goes this way, shut it down, they're never gonna buy from you. If it goes this way, then ask these two questions. And if you can sort of diagram that out such that cold call somebody and say, hey, do you drive a car? Yes, no. Do you need gasoline? Yes, no, right? And you get to that spot, then you know you've sort of understood the persona or the buying or the, the problem solving that they're going through. So one person at a time, don't take notes, don't use your PC, listen, ask open-ended questions, debrief. Um, I always did them with a second person because they would hear different things. So we'd sit down and we'd write stuff out and go, hey, you know what, they look like this. We have nicknames for the segments. You know, remember when I said 50 to 100? We'd, we'd start to draw circles around, hey, if you see somebody that looks like this, let's call them this name as a term of infection or endearment, um, not sarcastic. But it helped crystallize, oh, they, Fred, Sally, and Joey all look the same because of this sequence of questions. Um, so it can be um, pretty, pretty specific. Um, another good technique is, so Lori, if I understand you right, 
you're frustrated with the plumbing, you call the plumber, but you're not satisfied with your current vendor, and you'd say, oh, no, 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 I never said that. My plumber's been up, and I knew that I'm testing. I'm pushing the envelope, maybe saying some things wrong to get you to re-clarify and, and say, yes, you got it. Um, yeah. <laughs> So we're going to all tell that were it not for that, you know, divulging that, um, we, we might have invested in possibly changing that. So, um, number four, I have a good example. Um, we called on Samsung. Um, I would say this was the late 90s. So don't think smartphones, but almost starting. And we had a whole set of questions for this guy at Samsung. And he walks into the room and throws this little screen. This is one of the phones that screens that were about, about like a big post store. Throws a screen down and he goes, uh, this thing keeps burning up. And if you guys can help me with that, I'm all ears. And so the meaning changed to well, what's burning up, blah, blah, blah. And it turned out the Japanese were, you know, the classic, you know, commuting. I mean, they're trying to watch videos on these really small phones, and there's too much data being pushed to the to the screen and they're burning up. So his problem didn't have anything to do with the questions that we wanted to ask, but he quickly played the card of here's what's really important to me. Right. And so sometimes I tricked into this the other day. Somebody's solving a problem that's third or fourth time or less might be a great solution, but you got to ask the question, you know, what, do you, what keeps you up at night? Oh, making payroll. Okay. It's not fun. Or I have two key, two key accounts that I want to ensure are happy. Okay. It's not, you know, where you're going to be lunch. Right. So, where in the stack of problems are you poking? And that is meant to kind of get at that, right? Thank you. Make sense? Okay. And just on number nine, then, Brad, right, as quickly as possible, I, one thing I, I encourage people to do is to just be completely open and ask people that you can report an interview, mm -hmm. whether it be on Zoom, or you can pull out your phone and come on your report. It will be so much more valuable to get the actual. Right. Words and verbiage because you can pick up on things that even as delicate as tone can be responsive that you may lose context of the Yeah, that's a great idea. Because um when I was doing customer discovery, we didn't have phones with video or recording. Yeah, so we can everybody get, has that. Get an audio recording. Most well, people are completely fine, especially with audio texting. And if you're on Zoom, most people are fine with your point to do too. You can always hear from them. Yep. That's a great idea. All right. Um, I put this in for sample questions. This kind of gets to what's the hardest part about your job. Tell me about last time that was happened. Why was that hard? What did you do? Where did you go? Who'd you hang out with to try to get a solution to a, fit, a fix? How often do you experience it? So what you're really kind of testing for are things like value proposition, competitive differentiation, and then ROI, right? Because if you don't nail those pieces, and somebody's taking you through this, it's going to land kind of flat. And then ultimately, when working with professionals at Avocet, you'd like to be able to kind of frame a context. Hey, look, I'm going after um, male triathletes above 50, vision impaired. What they're really after is an alternative to Rudy and Oakley. Um, they they struggle on this particular issue. And the reason we're going to win is we fix that when we do it for same price, less price, higher price. If you can't articulate this, you probably haven't done enough customer discovery, enough interviews. You don't really understand um, why someone would adopt your product, solution, business. Why would they walk in the front door? So, so it seems academic, 
and it seems simple, but it's actually difficult to really get it right and really be able to say, hey, this is this is the bet we're making. And investors will poke on this in a lot of ways. Okay. All right, I've talked a little bit about this. Um, we had nicknames, segments, personas. Um, it was great when we went and worked with our agency. Let us tell you about day in the life. Here's this person, typically this age, this kind of skill set. This is what they're worried about. These are the things that give them joy in life in the context of work, right? Um, what matters to them, what motivates them, um, things that they're scared about, nervous about, that kind of thing. If you can get to that stage, you have a pretty good chance of um, succeeding. And so maybe the last part, bless you, on customer discovery is just, it's time, it's patience, um, much more listening than time. It's a journey you're learning, continuing to learn. Like you said, you're never over, right? I was doing it as a GM. Every chance you could get, hey, tell me what's going on. When did you guys shut down? Um, heard you got a new cell phone coming out. Yes, we do. <laughs> um, you're ready for validation when you can really bring clarity to the job to be done. Um, and this sets you up in front of an investor to kind of wrap back to where we started with investors. Um, if an, if an investor is poking on you and asking you questions and you run into a, I don't know, that's not really a good spot, right? If they take you as deep or deeper uh, and you keep saying, oh, well, let me tell you about Fred at Samsung or let me tell you about Sally. We talked to seven people that look like this and they're typically in mid-sized companies doing this task. Um, that only creates credibility that you really know who you're going after. And downstream, when you start doing sales or targeting or ads or anything, the tighter you can make that, um, the more successful you'll be, right? The more effective, whatever the medium is. All right. So moving from discovery to validation really means you're starting to sell, you're testing your value proposition, you're seeing who actually buys, right? Because think of going to market, you throw a hook um, with some bait in the water and you're thinking all the, all the perch will be attracted, but every once in a while a trout or a, something else bites and you go, hmm, really wasn't aimed at them. I'm wondering why they're, why are they buying? Um, we had orders come through every once in a while and somebody would go, who are these people? Why? And so we would call them. Say, hey, you just place another, and we're a big company. We did a couple hundred million a year, um, three or four thousand orders a month. Now I'd call them and I'd say, hey, oh, well, this is a result of, and here's some weird story. And you go, okay, it's kind of a one off. Um, and it didn't divert our focus. And we took the order and all that was good. But, um, but like you said, you're never really done, right? Is there a new segment lurking? somewhere in the weeds. Um, so this is kind of that same loop, right? Um, getting ready to sell, selling to evangelists, early positioning against competition, um, validating the business model that you actually can make money and uh, create orders. And I imagine where some of the, the clients that you see are already well into this loop, yeah, right? Yeah, and they're explaining to you, oh, we sell to this, but not so much over here. We wish we find, our, find ourselves fine tuning that quite a bit. In a lot of situations, um, they're still testing to buy the net. Mm -hmm. uh, yep. So that's an easy mistake. Yeah. And it's counterintuitive, too. I found that the tighter you focus, the more successful you were. Okay. Um, and, and have a story that convinces somebody that can actually execute and hit that you can always um, start small and start to layer out uh, to get more sales 
but you can't do the other. And um, if you don't hit something and create, then it's sort of game over, right? I mean, so I'm I'm a big I was a big proponent of focus and and um, brought that into startup land, and I think it it makes the most sense. Um, this is a great quote about product market fit. I'll just give you a second um, or two to read it. So sometimes we'll have clients that'll come in and we'll say, well, who did you pitch to? Who, who did you get traction with? And the classic answer is, you know, I must not be explaining it right. Or I'm just, um, you know, I know they need it and I can see, but they just aren't resonating. And that just has roots in, um, you haven't done a homework, homework, your value proposition isn't strong enough, or, um, or there's something you're missing about how they're solving that problem today. So we just did a whole Q&A surrounding entrepreneurs and the fact that they thought the product would sell itself. Right. Which sums us up very well. I mean, we've worked with over you know, 1,200 entrepreneurial organizations, some of them very, very low stage, but all of the early stage organizations, you know, they land in our office and they asked us to take equity because they'd run out of money right. and they did feel they needed to market the product. And you know, we always said no. Yeah. Thank you for telling me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And so I'm gonna um I'm gonna go to yeah, perfect. This is the next slide. So we started by saying, hey, failure raise money. That's not really what the issue is. Um, this is Scott Stack, independent of the survey. If you get that right, the other stuff downstream, like raising money, just gets hard or impossible. So, you know, in spite of the fact that clients would come to us and say, hey, I'm ready to raise money. Okay, let's see what you got. Almost always there was a deficit in who are you really going after and why do you think they're going to buy um, against the competition? How do you compare? What is your value proposition really? And then how big is the market and can you make a business out of it? But if you don't have that first part right, so that's why I stacked them. Sort of customer first, okay, competition, right? Because they have choices. There's very rarely a product in the world that is so new that there's no competition, even though the founders think there's no, there's some other way the problem is being solved. Um, in our lifetime, there's only a few true breakthrough innovations. And I would say like for me, the invention of called the web truly didn't exist. Communication existed, right? Email is just an electronic form of writing a, a letter, but that really was different, right? Cell phone, arguable, I don't think it's that different. It's just uncorded, same basic function. And then people get into, well, what about smartphones? Well, somebody married a computer and a phone. Get over it, right? Okay, so I, I stack them as customer competition. Um, if you get that right, then business models, can you make money? Do you have a cost structure um, that gives you a competitive advantage or allows you to turn a profit? And then you get that story good, funding gets easier. It doesn't necessarily flow, although that's what I wrote, but at least it gets easier. Make sense? Mm -hmm. All right. So that's how it shows up in a survey. That's my spin on which ones to to spend the most time on? It's really it's really a customer. Yeah. Is that the same as a business plan? A business model would be more akin to um, let's say a hardware business model. I'm going to sell you something. I have a cost structure behind it, and a, a subscription model would be different business model. But it's the 
How does the profit loss statement look? How does revenue get created? What's the cost structure? So not necessarily a business plan, but really truly the sort of the financial mechanism for how the company makes money. So they assume the business plan would be taking care of all of those especially the first two with like the SWOT analysis or all these yeah we'll it should <clears throat> it should um just as an aside you know a lot of appliance not sure the business plan you see it, it's 10 or 20 pages when you start poking in on who you really don't have to and why do they care and you can almost set the business plan aside even though they you know, the work and you want to be respectful of all that work um what's missing is what really matters, which is yeah. got all these. That's why I ask because I think there's so much emphasis on, oh, you're a business, get a plan right away. And if it doesn't focus on, I mean, how are you going to beat the competition? Who right. is the competition? And who actually buying? Right. I mean, I'm sure that's in the plan, but if it's not first and foremost, it seems like it's a waste of time. Yeah. And, and it won't result in funding if it's not crisp and tight and believable and, and withstand some degree of scrutiny and yeah. some questions. Um, there's a good tool called Business Model Canvas. Yeah, it's been strategizing. Yeah, strategy. and people sort of fall in the same track. They try to do the whole Canvas at once. Um, so let me back up. In case you don't know, the Canvas is an eight and a half by 11 sheet, and it's got blocks that are important. So one of the blocks is who are the partners that you're going to need to engage with to be successful, or who's the manufacturer? There's a block for customers. There's a block for product. Um, and so the mistake people make is they try to fill out the canvas before they really know the customer and product market fit. If you get that right, the canvas is in 20 minutes you can fill the rest of it out. If you don't get that right, you really struggle to figure out the rest of the thing. Shit up. Right? I don't know what partners I need because I don't really have a good understanding of customer competition business model. So it's a good tool. I like the tool, but people jump to try to sort of construct a house without getting a the foundation. Right. They have an augment to it called the value proposition canvas, which is really where I put people start. Okay. You start with value proposition canvas because that's just like what you just said. If you don't have that right, then the rest, the rest of itself doesn't really matter. matter. Yeah. So start, start with VPC then with yeah. VPC. Is that cool. part is that on his website or it, um, it is it's on Instagram, but or you just find like you okay. can Google like value processing canvas and just click it and Yeah, okay. Good. There's an enormous number of good tools out there. And um I like I resonate with Steve Blank, I think because his roots in California um tie back to the original formation of HP in 1939. The um, business model canvas we used to call the event step process in 1980. This is all it's, it is. And it's, the, the cool thing is that the, the main headlines like customer get that right, um, value proposition get that right, competition, that stuff doesn't change. So until somebody invents a new way of business, um, I'm sticking with it. Okay, good book, commercial. Um, there's some really good stuff in this. Um, I've given you the gift of hearing most of it in like 30 minutes, so you don't have to read it. But if you want to go deeper, it's um it's a pretty good resource. And that's it.